everyone, this is Olga Yaroshevsky and we continue the Next Change interview series with Dr. Hans Lombardo. He's a co-founder and CMO of BlockPass, which is a company focused on developing digital identity solutions. Hey, Doc, how are you? Hi. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's start with the good news. I heard that BlockPass has just announced the integration of um, digital identity yeah. services into Waves blockchain, right? Can you tell me more? Right. Yes, um, we've just uh, announced a partnership with Waves where we are providing identification uh, integration of our identica identification platform on Waves. We're truly going cross-chain and also we will be launching a version of our PASS token on Waves platform. Uh, of course, I don't know if you know, but our PASS token is a KYC forward token. So there's a bit, of, there's an element of verification involved in, in the actual PASS token as well as the application itself. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's um, it's very much, it's a demonstration of our effort to go to different blockchains and to try to provide a solution that's cross-platform, cross-chain. Sorry for the noise. <laughs> it's okay. So um, is it is it going to be a part of the KYC procedure, am I right? Yeah, it's basically a KYC as a service solution, but it's user-centric, it's self-sovereign. So the idea is that we don't keep any data on the user and um, the user decides on who they decide to send the data to, whether it's a cryptocurrency exchange, a, you know, virtual bank, a payment system, or a wallet. Uh, we've integrated with wallets as well, such as the Infinito wallet. So, so apart from Waves blockchain, which, which other chains do you support? I mean, we're, we're basically blockchain agnostic, uh, but we, um, you know, we originally built it for Ethereum. We were discussing it with uh, other chains. It, that's sort of in the pipeline. <laughs> we haven't confirmed it. Waze is really our sec the second blockchain that we've we've partnered with, and we're very happy. Uh, they've got a great team, and uh, they've got a lot of a lot of things that they're working on. But we've um, integrated with uh, various cryptocurrency exchanges, including Bitfinex's Fnex, as well as um, uh, Infinita Wallet, uh, and uh, we uh, have partnerships with Token Economica, um, as well as Legacy uh, Trust, which is a custody digital asset custody provider. So, um, but we're getting a lot of also mainstream interest as well from virtual banks, payment systems, casinos, uh, hotels, um, and even broker system integrators for traders, mainstream traders. So. Interoperability is one of the basic features, right, of the whole digital ID systems. Is this is this one of the main goals to make it interoperable, like everywhere? Yes. So we have uh, our, 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 the idea is to um, get up to a certain point where we have a critical mass because um, the um, the BlockPass app is a an application that has pre-verified users on it. So the pre-verified users that are maybe operating on one chain can go and use another chain, or on one exchange can go and use another exchange with just one button, just by selecting it. And so the idea is that they don't have to do KYC over, over again so many times, they're already pre-verified. So we bring that, and after a while, we build up enough critical mass that uh, it just becomes standard. How many users do you have right now? We've got uh, about 10,000 users, but uh, we need to, re you know, it, it'll take a while. We need to build out when we add more and more blockchains. One of the problems is, is that uh, with the slowdown in the crypto markets, uh, there was sort of a drop off in users, but uh, we're going, you know, we're, you know, going to all kinds of different uh, merchants now. So we'll create a critical mass. You mentioned um, some virtual banks being interested in technology. Yeah. I know that, uh, banking industry in general has taken digital ideas very seriously. Like, uh, for example, I read an article about the Nordic region, especially in Norway yeah. and in Sweden. Uh, people are using digital identity as um, like every day, as using a toothbrush. Um, why do you think similar initiatives have not penetrated other markets in Europe or Asia or have not experienced similar traction or similar size mass adoption? What stops people or banks from start using digital ideas? I think the, um, the issue is, is in the emerging, uh, where, it, where it's finding more application is in emerging financial services. So like uh, challenger banks, virtual banks, 
Um, and the reason is, is that the traditional banks um, have issue, you know, they, they're reluctant to share infrastructure. You know, it's the same thing with blockchain and uh, banks, right? Uh, banks haven't gone totally to blockchain because they're not comfortable with sharing infrastructure with their competitors. Where um, in, ba in virtual banking, in these virtual fi financial services, the cost of the infrastructure, infrastructure is so high that they're willing to consider sharing infrastructure and having things like interoperability of digital ID. So, um, and I mean, if you go back and look at when R3 launched and they, um, you know, signed up all these banks and it was very hard for them to keep all those banks in this sort of uh, consortium because, you know, there were some banks that are leaving because they don't want to share that infrastructure. So an old traditional bank has issues with that. Although it would make sense, they would save funds and it would make it easier for the, for the users. If, you, if, if there's one, one sort of stop shop, sign up, one stop, one stop shop sort of identity verification system where the user controls that identity and then is able to pick what banks and service providers that they want to sign up for. And not only banks, which brings me yeah. to, my, uh, to my next question. Which industries do you think digital ID will disrupt the most apart from virtual banking? You know, there, there is insurance. Insurance is huge. Um, there's a, a traditional trading, uh, which will be basically merged with e-trading. I mean, digital, digital securities. I think the security token market needs DID in a big way particularly self-sovereignty ID, because of the compliance requirement. In order for um, token offerings, digital token offerings, to go mainstream and be, become the security token offering that's accepted by like regulators, you need that DID um, and you know, so regulated DID um, component. Otherwise, you can't go this sort of ICO anonymous route completely. So I think that's very important. But all these industries um, will, will benefit. I mean, DI, DID is not only a, a user um, concept, but also a business. There's also business ID, which is a component. We're working on a product as part of BlockPass that's a business ID product, which will allow um, businesses to trade, um, set up bank accounts, trade with very quick and easy rather than this really painful KYC process. So this basically helps um, businesses and people to just get rid of the work. How is it better yeah. than the regular ID, like my passport? Why can I just scan right. my passport and then send it to I don't know to anyone? Right. So it's 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 in your in your um, on your phone, stored on your phone. All your data is there, and then you can easily sign up for all kinds of services. The same thing you can you'll be able to do that with your business ID as well. And you'll be able to set up your business ID um, with other people. Let's say your other directors in your business, they'll have black pass, black pass ID, and they'll be able to sign up. A group ID, right? Yeah, right. You create a group ID that's all linked together, and then you'll have your documentation, such as your certificate of incorporation, your um, articles of association, and all your corporate documents will be in there so that you can easily like if you want to sign up for Revolut Bank or some, you know, some virtual bank, you can log in and then send them that information, all of what, all of what they require to set up an account. Um, so um, I recently attended um, a conference on AI and smart cities, and some experts talk a lot about integration of digital ID systems into smart city systems. I think it's working properly now. And can you name any examples or use cases that you know of? Well, I mean, the the the, dan the danger in AI. I mean, there's a the risk in using AI um, to a certain extent, but AI can also help with um, uh, sort of the logic of of some of these systems um, and and making sure that uh, um, there's not errors, it can also spot like fraudulent documents and, and, and it can be used for that. So that's sort of the application where that can be used. It can be used to, um, particularly machine learning, can be used to um, weed out the problematic errors in, in sort of when, for example, when an ID is scanned um, or passport is scanned, it can help pre prevent 
the sort of uh, errors that happen with machine machine scans. So that's definitely being used already um, by various uh, verification providers. So I think I mean more. Um, I think I mean wider systems like a smart city system when it is yeah. integrated not only in. Um, uh, let's say a financial system, but in transportation, logistics, healthcare. So if once mm -hmm. you have a digital ID, you are basically logged in any system and inside a smart system. Yeah, that's true. I mean, some examples are you, um, there's a biometric component or a facial recognition component where you, let's say you want to check into your home, hotel room. You don't need to go to the front desk. You just walk up to the, you're given a hotel room number. You walk up to the hotel room and there's some the scans your face and you're able to go into your hotel room, check in that way. You don't, it kind of cuts down on, so you can do that on a higher, wider scale. You can do that with offices, uh, houses, you know, you know, but of course there's always a danger that biometrics can then be somehow utilized to, for abuse. And, but it's definitely something that's going to happen. It's already being implemented um, in, 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 in many ways where, um, and, and there are hotels, for example, there are hotels that are, have come to, to us and talked to us about using block pass in that way where, where we create a, an ID, an ID sort of um, uh, digital ID, and then you're able to just check into your hotel room without any much difficulty, seamless. So, how yeah, does it, with, uh, with, how does it call with privacy then? What if you yeah. want to give out my data, but still want to be inside the system? Well, um, the way BlockPass does it is that we don't keep any data. So BlockPass itself, the application doesn't keep data on the user. So the merchants may have to because it's the regulator requires it. But in, in the case, we're, we're developing more technology where we use things like zero knowledge proof, where you can give a certain amount of information maybe there's a facial recognition component and that's all the information you get give and uh that data then is some at some point deleted from from that system or removed from that system we have a lab that we invested in 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 a, a university in scotland at napier university it's called the black pass identity lab and one of the technologies that we're working on is proof of the del deletion of data which means that if you have uh, data on, uh, and for example, on your Facebook account or your Google account, you want to close it down, um, you'll be able to prove that that data has been deleted and removed, or you can pull that data back. So that, so these are the techno types of technology that are going to be, as well as the zero knowledge proof technology. Now, zero knowledge proof technology is basically you're only giving bits of information that is enough if enough data to prove that you're you can be authenticated and then you're able to use certain services. So um, that's, that's kind of the future. Now, um, whether uh, the, the, the difficulties in educating regulators and governments that that's a suit, you know, suitable authentication regime. Do you have a digital ID yourself? I assume you do. Yeah, I mean, I have a block pass ID, <laughs> so is it quick. working properly today? I mean, today, what can you do with yeah. your digital ID today? Pay for your coffee or I don't know, make a doctor's appointment. Well, with this, with block pass right now, it's only being used in cryptocurrency uh, uh, exchanges and things like Waves, but you can sign up and you can use it to. Uh, log into your sign up for your for your FNX account and trade invest in token offerings but eventually um, you can use it uh, for any kind of regulated service so right now block, block pass is being built for regulated services um, so any kind of regulated service whether it's um, uh, investment uh, insurance uh, we're uh, we're working with casino management to actually use it for gam gambling, because gambling gambling is a highly regulated, uh, um, you know, institute uh, industry. So any kind of industry where there's, where there's regulation, um, we're talking to health services about using it for um, health professionals, where they can use the the app to uh, verify their credentials. They can store their credentials in it and. Uh, 
So we're also, um, you know, some other industries. One is the Canna products industry in the United States. They're very interested in the, in the, in the application because it's heavy, heavy regulated. And so there's a user and uh, application for it, but as well as a merchant application for it because they're regulated and they have to um, provide data on those, you know, the consumers. Um, so in certain markets like, you know, California. So, I mean, there's all, there's huge potential for it. Um, and are particularly on the business. Any, Sorry? Are there any obstacles from the reg regulators? Um, the, the, the obstacle is, you know, we, we don't keep data and there's some regulators that want to be able to, in some countries, they want to be able to have the data. So there's always a tricky thing in working with that out, working how we can keep to our philosophy is that we keep no data, we're user-centric, user self-sovereign. So that's kind of, can be tricky in some markets. Some markets it's like, they, they love it. I mean, it's built for GDPR. So from a European context, it's, it's a popular, it's a, actually a popular application with European Union you know, officials. So, so, I mean, there's that hurdle. And then there's, um, is very much the, um, the user centric concept is not always not popular with all sort of, uh, you know, large corporations, you know, who want to have the data. So, you know, you have these large corporations, you know, most of the data on the internet is centralized, it's controlled by corporations, you know, big internet companies and um, credit, credit bureaus and things like that. And they, they're resistant to this. They don't want the user to be in charge of their data. So, you know, there's that hurdle um, as well. But ultimately, it's going to be a struggle to, but we're, we're, we, we think we can persevere and we think we can get a lot of, you know, other DID um, service providers to form an ecosystem where we can um, sort of bring about this change. Looking forward Good. to it. Okay, Hans, thank you so much. And I'll see you soon. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Have a good day. <laughs>